Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first ID IIDR combined rounds for 2021. Uh, I'm Lori Burroughs. I am a professor in biochemistry and the interim director of the IIDR. Uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome our speakers. Um, so our first speaker will be Phil Elhulu, who is an associate professor in, at McMaster's Department of Medicine. He is involved in the university's undergraduate and residency programs, and he is the head of service of infectious diseases at St. Joe's. He has a keen interest in HIV AIDS and tuberculosis, and today he's going to be talking to us about a tuberculosis infection of the bone marrow leading to systemic immunosuppression. Our second speaker today is Mathy Jananthan. She is a senior research scientist in Zoe Zing's lab. She got her PhD from the University of London in the UK, studying the pathogenesis of latent tuberculosis infection. And over the last 15 years, she's been studying respiratory mucosal vaccines and vaccine strategies against tuberculosis in both preclinical and clinical settings, as well as host defense against respiratory virus and bacterial infections. And today, Matthew will be speaking to us about the immunological events following respiratory mucosal vaccination against tuberculosis. So thank you both for speaking today, and I will pass it over to Phil to get us started. So I think we debated who would go first, but I would like you guys to think about at least my part of the talk is what happens after somebody gets tuberculosis in them. And Maddie will be talking about how sort of the inhalation and how we get to that. I just want to make sure everyone can see my slides. Looks good. Perfect. So this is a 49 year old gentleman. He was an immigrant from Ethiopia who moved to Canada around eight years ago. So this case we saw actually the summer of 2020, which was sort of the summer of COVID. He was unemployed over the past year. He was described as depressed. His family was back in Ethiopia. He had type 2 diabetes and he was on a metformin and was complaining of some lower back pain. He said she came to the hospital in Guelph on July the 4th. He was a very warm summer day and his temperature was found to be 40. He was confused and encephalopathic in his car. So he came in quite sick, got a lot of antibiotics. The significant things on his lab is he was very profoundly pancytopenic. So his white cell count was very low, his platelet count was very low, and his hemoglobin was very low. He also had a seizure a few days later and essentially got sicker. So he was only on metformin at home, and this is a list of all the medications he got at the hospital, escalation of antibiotics, a bit of meningeal treatment with meropenem and acyclovir, but really sort of, you know, what I like to call kitchen sink therapy on this patient. I will mention the B12, and that's a bit significant, at least in some of the issues later on. So, Essentially, it's been seen in Guelph ER prior with some back pain, and his blood work had shown these abnormalities. And it was always a sort of issue when he came in, was, was this just sort of a heat stroke, or was he actually febrile? One of my colleagues, an ID consultant, saw him, and because he was neutropenic for a very long time, the issue was what was causing this, was this sort of a bone marrow problem, like lymphoma or leukemia. And then classically with, you know, an African gentleman, we always worry about HIV and tuberculosis. So we do the Panman CT, look at his brain and try to diagnose what's going on. So, so we're looking again, again, things, these are sort of a bit mentioned earlier, but he had this very high temperature, the slurred speech, the low white cell count, and then his smear showed mild fragments of allocytes and mild teardrop cells. So definitely a lot of hematological abnormalities. His original CT was not that impressive, and this sort of made us less suspicious of tuberculosis, or at least we couldn't find any imaging or clinical evidence of disease. But then three weeks later, he essentially got this uh, ground glass appearance in his lungs, got a lot worse into lobular septal thickening, tree and bud nodularity, worsening consolidation. And even the radiologist, when he saw this, thought this was more pulmonary edema or fluid in the lungs or ARDS, but they didn't say it was classic of tuberculosis. 
So here, when they're alluding to this tuberculosis, it's really what we like to think of immunocompetent tuberculosis, so cavities, upper lobe disease, all of that stuff. He also developed anasarca, but he was getting a lot of fluid in the ICU over three weeks, and there was no evidence of any bone disease. It was a bit complicated getting specimens from him, particularly the bone marrow, which was a bit difficult to get. But essentially, a few days after all of this, so remember, he'd come into the hospital on July the 4th. But essentially, things sort of started growing. July 16th, we sort of got, you know, some cultures. July 29th, August 4th. But essentially, things took quite a while to grow before we were able to document the tuberculosis. But he actually grew tuberculosis, so, you know, four weeks in, so not a huge burden of disease. As I said, originally his original bone marrow was dry, so they only got a tiny bit. And after sort of a week of waiting for the results, in the small amount, they found a non-necrotizing granuloma. Then we were able to do a second bone marrow that had a lot more amount, and that was full of non-necrotizing granulomas. AFB were seen then, the culture turned out to be positive for TB. And when we had the non-necrotizing granuloma in the AFB, his diagnosis became much more clear. So I'm going to review a paper from Saudi Arabia, which is the largest case series I've been able to find about TB in the bone marrow, where they reviewed 22 cases between 1990 and 2002. Essentially, they reviewed their pathologies and saw if they had any mycobacterium tuberculosis growing from the bone marrow specimens. And these were all culture positive. So these patients usually have underlying conditions that put them at risk of immunosuppression. So Four patients had solid organ transplants, HIV was in two patients, diabetes in three. And like our current patient, there were no risk factors found in 12 patients, 55%, so a bit more than half. Once again, even though everyone thinks of TB as caseating granulomas, a tuberculosis can also be non-caseating, and that's really the level of your immunity. So if your immunity is strong, then you'll probably go on to caseate. But if you're immunocompromised for whatever reason, then in my experience, usually the granulomas are non-caseating. Their outcomes were sort of 50-50. 11 patients did really well. However, 10 patients passed away during hospitalization. And usually these patients get treated for a full year. And now essentially the rest of my talk is gonna be a bit of a hodgepodge about tuberculosis and immunity. So, so classically, we see patients with latent tuberculosis, and we worry which of these patients are going to move on to get active disease, and that's usually a big factor in giving preventative therapy. So we know that advanced untreated HIV infection is a big risk factor with RRs of around 9.9 or 9.5. If you've had close contact with someone with tuberculosis, your RR is 6. So if you're living with somebody who has active pulmonary tuberculosis, odds are you going to get infected if you're recently infected. If we see sort of an old x-ray that has old heel tuberculosis that was never treated, so someone who immigrated to Canada but could have had exposure in their original country. Prednisone of greater than 15 milligrams per day also increases the risk, but the RR here is 2.8. Chronic renal failure, treatment of TNF inhibitors, so any patients who are requiring therapy for either arthritic conditions, inflammatory bowel disease, should always be screened for tuberculosis. Poorly controlled diabetes, our patient probably was not under the best control, 1.7, weight loss, and then smoking. But as you see, the RR sort of an ascending order. So these are some of the factors. So what happens with HIV? And essentially, if somebody's exposed, you get early disease in normal people around 2%. For HIV infected, you get early disease around 30 or 40%. Then in the bulk of normal patients, the disease stays dormant, so 98%. In HIV infected, if you don't get infected early, the 30 or 40%, it stays dormant, 60 or 70%. And that's why we try to use preventative therapy on all of our HIV patients. And then essentially, some of these patients will die with latent TB. So a normal person, that's 90 to 96%. Your lifetime risk of activation is somewhere between 2 to 10%. But with HIV, these numbers are a lot higher. So 20 to 50% with HIV, while 30 to 50% will go on to die with latent TB. So definitely HIV increases the progression or the risk of activation of latent disease. And I like this slide because essentially we tend to think of TB as sort of latent and active, but there's clearly sort of a whole spectrum of disease. So some patients eliminate the disease completely or you get innate immune response or you get more acquired immunity. And I think even though you know, tuberculosis has been described in mummies from ancient Egypt, our knowledge of the immunology of TB is still 
moderately primitive or at least mine is. With latent tuberculosis, you get the granuloma. The granuloma tries to contain it. Some recent data has shown that every single granuloma in every patient functions independently. So essentially you need to have all your granulomas controlling every single TB organism that you're exposed to, to be able to keep it latent. Then you go on to subclinical disease and then you activate your disease. And these are some of the tests and some of the symptoms. I also wanna get into what's known as paradoxical reactions in tuberculosis. So this is essentially either clinical or radiological worsening. So either you have the known lesions that look worse or you get new lesions in someone who you're treating. So this happens while you're treating somebody with active tuberculosis and then they get worse a few weeks in. This syndrome is recognized for a very long time. It's often self-limiting, but it can cause morbidity and rarely death. And it's a bit unclear what the paradoxical reaction is, but the feeling has always been this is an abnormal immune response or reconstitution of an immune response. I've seen this sometimes in cases of miliary tuberculosis or disseminated tuberculosis, where the patient's not developing an immune response to their disease, and then you treat them, and then they will get the immune response. This happens much more frequently in HIV infection and is much better described. Paradoxical reaction is a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to make sure the patient is currently taking their therapy, they don't have any drug resistance, or there's no other diagnoses. But essentially, we see paradoxical reactions even in patients who don't have HIV, just treating regular TB. It's much more frequent with lymph nodes TB. So your lymph node will sort of get bigger and start draining. And the incidence of this is somewhere around 20%. So site of disease and patient population is an issue, worsening of original lesions. Sometimes CNS disease can manifest when it's been clinically silent. And pleural disease is something very common with reactivation of paradoxical reactions. So very bad pleural reactions, skin lesions, or draining lymph nodes. The WHO estimates that approximately a third of the world's population is infected with tuberculosis. And Five to 10% of these will develop HIV, which is a greatest risk factor for reactivation of tuberculosis. Within HIV AIDS and TB or HIV AIDS on its own, there's something known IRIS, which is uh, immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, immune restoration disease, paradoxical reactions. And essentially it's sort of similar to the thing that I described to you earlier, but it's much more clearly described in HIV AIDS, particularly in the setting of mycobacterial disease, both tuberculosis and MAC. So you get a paradoxical inflammatory reaction against a foreign antigen. That antigen can be alive or dead. In any patient that you've started treating for HIV where they've been very immunocompromised and now they're reconstituted. And there's sort of a couple of things that can happen based on the slides. So you have a new opportunistic infection. You start the therapy for HIV and then they get a reaction or the opposite happens where you have somebody who has HIV, they're very immunocompromised, you start treating them, and then the tuberculosis declares itself. So you can either unmask underlying opportunistic infections or essentially worsen them. So key points with TB iris and setting of HIV is you have to have the diagnosis of tuberculosis confirmed. Usually the patient's improving with TB therapy before you give them the HIV therapy. The symptoms start usually one to four weeks after you've started the HIV therapy. You get much more inflammatory features of tuberculosis. You need to exclude other things and exclude drug-resistant tuberculosis. Iris is not, there's no test or anything. So we've had patients who've been febrile or unwell for weeks to months after we do this. And usually when they're in the hospital, people keep calling you saying what's going on. These patients get a lymphoproliferative response to the mycobacterial antigen in vitro. They can restore their TB skin test. They have increased activation of immunological markers, IL-6 and CD38, and also TNFA-308-1 star and IL-6. When you look at the literature with this, essentially this is sort of a bit of a prevalence of TB and iris and HIV AIDS. And the numbers are even higher if you look in places of India or South Africa or other places where TB co-infection is much more prevalent with HIV infection. Some of the risks are if you have disseminated disease or extra pulmonary disease, 
if you start the ART treatment within six weeks of TB treatment, so you've not had a lot of time to get the TB sort of level or disease burden down. If the CD4 count for the HIV patient is very low, usually with therapy, the CD4 count jumps up and a fall in the HIV viral load. And probably basilar burden has a factor. So the more disease you have, the more likely you are to immunity constitute. As I said, it starts a few days or a couple of weeks after you start the therapy, but it can go on to months and years. And the average length of symptoms is between 10 to 40 days. And the patients can be a febrile or unwell. And essentially you can get atypical presentations of classic opportunistic infections as the patient's responding to antiviral therapy. And this happens in HIV with other pathogens. So mycobacterial disease tends to be the classic one. So. So you get persistent fever, there's no real source, worsening lymphadenopathy, and then the cervical lymphadenopathies of CNS disease that may manifest that you were not aware that disease was present as the patient was quite immunocompromised. So some of the things that are going on is our innate immunity is probably stimulated with TREM stimulation, inflammasome activation, which tends to be the big mechanism of iris, IL-1 and IL-18 production, membrane rupture, you also get adaptive arms, so your T cells specifically to the mycobacterial pathogens are actually getting reactivated and waking up, because essentially you get disseminated disease against mycobacteria when these T cells are asleep or not able to contain it. So you get a lot of lymphoid pro-inflammatory cytokines, hypercytokinemia, TNF-alpha, uh, interferon gamma, and IL-6 production. And also with the effector arm, you get more neutrophil activation, and matrix degradation and release of antigenic content. And all of these essentially cause TB iris together. So looking at all of these sort of uh, different arms, you've got this high itogen load, which is usually because you've got a low CD4 count and not a lot of inflammatory response. You start the ARTs, you get an uncoupling of both the innate and the acquired immunity. You get restoration of a lot of pathogen specific cellular immune response probably by both treating the infection as well as treating the HIV. You get a lot of procytokine inflammatory activity and you can get either localized you know, tissue edema or systemic inflammatory response. For anyone who wants to know more about this, it's probably the best paper that I could find within nature on mechanisms. So more toll-like receptors and inflammasome signaling. I will summarize some of their findings here. So essentially, we get a lot of significant transcription as early as the you know, first week once you start ART therapy. You also get activation of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and then the onset of TBI is usually a couple of weeks in. You get overactivation of the TLR signaling, the TREM activation of the inflammasome, and also plasma cytokines, CAPase 1 and 5 inhibition of MID88 adapter and group one caspases and secretion of cytokines, including IL-1. So I think this happens much more clearly in the setting of TB, HIV, iris, and probably happens in disseminated tuberculosis or tuberculosis that's not controlled in the setting because essentially there is sort of some antigenic or your, your immune system is not able to control the TB antigen and that's what causes some TB dissemination. This is more of a picture of what I've shown earlier. There has been a study looking at paradoxical TB with iris and HIV and looking at treatment of prednisone. So prednisone 40 milligrams for 14 days and then 20 milligrams for 14 days. This was done in South Africa in a setting where they have a lot of TB. So classically, my approach has always been to wait until patients develop iris and then treat them with prednisone. But this sort of recommends that if you're treating anyone with HIV and tuberculosis and immunosuppression to give, you know, essentially prophylactic prednisone to try to minimize iris. And essentially the patients who got prednisone had lower iris, 32% versus 46%. So I'm gonna go back to our case and I think we're leaving questions at the end. I think there were a few questions that I saw on that and I'll try to answer them during Matty's part of the talk. But this gentleman actually clearly developed iris pulmonary disease because essentially his CT was normal on presentation and definitely worsened a few weeks into the hospitalization. This happened before we started TB therapy because the diagnosis was not yet confirmed and he was also HIV negative. And we can have discussions about what we think happened with this patient. <laughs>
And at this point, I'll move it to Maddie and she'll talk to us about mucosal exposure to tuberculosis and how we can try to prevent these outcomes from happening in patients. Yeah. Uh, um, so thank you very much. Um, Dr. Zing has been working on respiratory mucosal vaccination strategies against TB for more than two decades. And I have been working with him over just now 15 years. So today I will present the progress we have made so far in understanding the immunological events and the protective correlates following mucosal vaccination. So we have heard a lot. We have heard a lot uh, about this uh, TB and the immunology of TB from Phil now. I just want to just to give some introduction about TB now. So pre-pandemic, TB was the number one killer of all infectious diseases, and it killed almost 1.5 million people in 2018. As we heard, co-infection of TB and HIV is a huge burden on healthcare system in TB endemic countries. And the situation even is, is even more worrisome due to, sorry, okay. Give me a sec. Okay. So the situation is even more worrisome uh, due to the ongoing pandemic. The pandemic situation and lockdowns presents many challenges to keep up with TB services. And the modeling data suggests that there could be additional 1.4 million deaths by 2025 if even a three month lockdown is imposed. Okay. The only vaccine available to prevent TB is the BCG, which is a life attenuated vaccine and it's, a, it's introduced almost a century ago. To date, BCG is given to more than 1 billion children and the BCG is effective against childhood form of TB, such as disseminated TB or meningitis. However, it's not effective against uh, pulmonary TB in adults, or it's variable against pulmonary TB in adults. BCG vaccination is important in the context of HIV infection. However, if the children born to HIV infected mothers become HIV positive, they are at high risk of acquiring actual TB disease after BCG vaccination. So given the shortcomings of BCG, last two decades have seen tremendous efforts to develop new TB vaccines. So the TB vaccine candidate pipeline includes various vaccine platforms, including whole cell based vaccines, they are inactivated or live attenuated, adjuvanted protein vaccines, and recombinant subunit vector vaccines. These vaccines are being developed as BCG replacement or early life immunization, or as booster for adolescents or adults. Two of these vaccines have already gone through efficacy trial. One is a viral vector vaccine, MBA and Gen 85A, which was evaluated in infants in South Africa. Unfortunately, it has failed to demonstrate any efficacy. The other vaccine that has been recently completed efficacy trial is developed by GSK M72. It has recently completed the efficacy trial in the age group of 18 to 55 in Kenya, South Africa, and Zimbabwe in latently infected people. So the results from this M72 efficacy trials are very promising. The vaccine was safe and demonstrated 50% efficacy. While results from the, this uh, trial is encouraging, it is expected to be ready only in the coming years. Comparing this to the rapid rollout of vaccines for COVID-19 raises the question why we are unable to develop a TB vaccine so soon. One reason that we all know is the political commitment and the financial investment went into the COVID-19 vaccine development. The other important reason is the complexity of the anti-TB immunity. Tubercle bacilli has been evolving with mankind for centuries and devised mechanisms to evade immune responses. We still don't fully understand the dynamic of the immunological events that unfold after the infection and the protective immune correlates also we don't know still. 
So the next slide shows a very simplified immunological events that happens after infection. So the first cell to encounter the incoming bacilli is the alveolar macrophage. And antigens released from the macrophages are then taken up by antigen percenting cells and adaptive immunity is induced in the draining lymph nodes. Then adaptive immune cells, adaptive immune cells that arrive at the lung then contain the infection by forming granuloma. However, as I mentioned earlier, mycobacteria has devised many mechanisms to evade the innate immune system. As such, it delays the recruitment of T cells to the lung. This delay allows continued replication of tubercle bacilli. And at this point, even the arrival of T cells is unable to control the bacterial burden. So based on how each and every individual react, reacting to this infection, the spectrum of clinical outcomes can occur following infection. In five to 15% of exposed individuals, infection leads to primary active disease. However, in majority of them, infection is controlled without any symptoms, but they go on to develop latent infection. Latently infected individuals mount an adaptive immune response and become positive for tuberculin or in the front gamma release assay. Risk factors such as HIV infection or compromising the immune system can reactivate the latent infection and leads to active disease. One of the other clinical outcomes that has recently received considerable attention is the early clearance of bacteria without mounting an adaptive immune system. Many observational case, case contact studies consistently reported that a proportion of heavily exposed individuals do not become tuberculin positive or IGRA positive, meaning that despite of heavy exposure, these individuals do not mount an adaptive immune response. So a recent study has tested this observation experimentally in household contacts of TB index cases in Indonesia. So what they found was that 24% of participants persistently remained tuberculin negative for up to 14 weeks. And also importantly, these individuals have displayed heightened innate immune activation, suggesting that the innate immune system may have played a role in early clearance. The critical role of innate immune, um, immunity is also highlighted by another study. In this study, alveolar macrophages from infants and older children were compared for their anti-TB immunity. Authors have hypothesized that AM of infants who are likely to develop lethal disseminated TB compared to older children would be defective in their anti-TB immunity. Yes, indeed, this study found that infants' AMs were less effective in controlling infection and associated with lower expression of genes involved in NDTB immunity. So what all this suggests is that an optimal vaccination strategy should be able to trigger an NDTB immunity in the adaptive immune system and also in innate immune system, which should be in the respiratory mucosal site, the site of infection. So this emphasized that the route of vaccination should be one of the considerations when we develop vaccines for TB. So in a recent review, we have provided an up-to-date overview of strategies to improve TB vaccine, set, vaccine development. So among the TB vaccine candidates, the most suitable platform for respiratory mucosal vaccination is the viral vector vaccine. Currently, four vaccines, including the adenoviral serotype 5 based vaccine developed here at MAC, are being tested in human trials. Diverse adenoviral serotypes have been explored for vaccine development, particularly adenovirus serotype 5, the common cold, cold cause um, virus has been used as the vector in HIV vaccines and also now in COVID-19 vaccine. AD5 is an attractive vaccine platform because it has a track record of safety. They are also easy to manipulate genetically and has natural tropism to respiratory mucosa. 
In addition, the other, uh, other advantage is the ability of this platform to induce strong and sustainable immune responses. So the other adenovirus serotype 5 based TB vaccine at Q5 antigen 85A is a replication deficient platform. In this vaccine, genes responsible for viral rep replication are replaced with an immunodominant antigen of MTB, antigen 85A, under the CMB promoter. So this vaccine has been evaluated in a variety of animal models following parenteral or mucosal route of vaccination. In all these animal models, what we have found was that the mucosal vaccination is superior to parenteral vaccination in providing protection against pulmonary TB. Not only in these animal models, we have also evaluated this in a humanized mice model system, and we found the same similar outcome following mucosal vaccination. So further analysis of immune responses following these two routes of vaccination revealed a stark difference in the geographical localization of vaccine-induced immunity. So parenteral vaccination results in strong systemic but poor mucosal immunity. Vaccine-induced T cells were trapped in the vasculature and failed to enter the respiratory mucosa following vaccination. As such, upon infection, Arrival of T cells to the mucosa was delayed as in an unvaccinated host. This allowed tubercle bacilli to establish the infection in the lung. In contrast, respiratory mucosal vaccination induces long lasting mucosal immunity by recruiting T cells into the airways, such as, as such, upon infection, mucosal residing T cells rapidly recognize and kill infected cells and control the infection without causing much immunopathology to the lung. So in addition to these adaptive immune responses, we have recently learned that respiratory mucosal vaccination can also alter the alveolar macrophages after respiratory infections. So in alveolar macrophages in respiratory mucosal immunized host demonstrated pro-defense signature, they expressed high levels of defense gene, heightened bacterial activity against heterologous infections, and also they demonstrated glycolytic metabolism. These features actually resembles the phenotype of a trained innate immunity. So what's trained innate immunity? This is a term coined recently to describe the new paradigm shift in our understanding of immune memory. So the long term belief is that immune memory can be established only by adaptive immune system. And recently this knowledge has been challenged by the finding that innate immune system can also remember the in initial exposure to an antigen or microbe. Epigenetic or metabolic and metabolic rewiring after the initial exposure leads to an enhanced response to the secondary exposure of same or unrelated antigen or microbe. So all these characteristics of trained innate immunity has also been de demonstrated by the alveolar macrophages in respiratory mucosa at Q5 immunized host. So all these observations suggest that Compared to parenteral administration, respiratory mucosal delivered TB vaccine is able to elicit an immunity comprising of tissue resident memory T cells and memory alveolar macrophages, and these provide enhanced protection against TB. So after the extensive preclinical studies, we have first evaluated our TB vaccine in humans following parenteral route of vaccination. So in this first trial, we found that a single dose intramuscular vaccination is safe and potently boosts polyfunctional CD4 and CD8 T cell in previously BCG vaccinated participants. In a subsequent study, we also evaluated the T cell repertoire induced by this vaccine. We found that the T cells elicited can recognize multiple epitopes of antigen 85A in the context of common HLA alleles in humans. 
So based on these encouraging results, we next evaluated the safety and immunogenicity of the vaccine following aerosol delivery in our second trial. This trial was launched in March 2019 and completed early 2021 after having many challenges, encountering many challenges due to pandemic. So the preprint of this study is now available online if anyone interested to read into it. I will present some of the data from this study. So this trial was designed to evaluate safety of escalating doses of aerosol vaccination and also to compare the immunogenicity induced by aerosol vaccination at the respiratory mucosa to that induced by the intramuscular vaccination. So we have obtained bongo alveolar lavages at baseline two week or eight week post vaccination and uh, analyzed all immunological uh, and, uh, parameters. One of the important aspect of this trial is the well characterized aerosol device system that was used to administer the vaccine. For aerosol delivery, 0.5 ml vaccine was loaded and the inhalation was completed in two and a half minutes by the participants. Aerosol droplets generated by this system was in average five micron in size, which allows a deep lung deposition of the vaccine. So in terms of safety, aerosol vaccination is very safe. We did not observe any significant abnormalities in the lab test, or we didn't see any abnormalities in respiratory functions. And also, there was no significant airway inflammation after vaccination, as we did not see any changes or alterations in the neutrophil counts or eosinophil counts in low dose, high dose, or intramuscular, <coughs> intramuscular vaccinated people. However, we have seen a transient reduction in the alveolar macrophages in the low dose and high dose group, and an increase in the lymphocyte counts in the low dose aerosol group. So evaluation of TH1 responses in the ARBs showed significant increase in vaccine-specific CD4 T cells following low-dose and high-dose aerosol vaccination, and the responses remained elevated up to eight weeks in low-dose aerosol group. In contrast, intramuscular vaccination failed to induce vaccine-specific T cell responses in the ARBs. This resembles what we have seen in all our animal models. In addition, polyfunctional T cells were also uh, produced by low dose aerosol vaccination. That means that most of the CD4 T cells, antigen specific T cells induced by vaccine were, were able to produce all three cytokines, interferon gamma, TNF alpha, and IL2, that are very important for the anti TB immunity. In addition, we also found that vaccine-specific CD4 T cells induced by aerosol vaccination was able to form tissue-resident memory T cells. And we know now that lung tissue-resident memory T cells are very critical to provide mucosal immunity. In addition, we also examined the alveolar macrophages in these low-dose aerosol vaccinated people. And we found that Inconsistent with our observation in our animal models following respiratory mucosal vaccination, alveolar macrophages in these low dose participants have also been modulated following vaccination. Genes associated with immune responses were enriched in these macrophages and suggesting a transcriptional change for enhanced defense response. One of the major concerns about ad 5 based vaccine is the pre-existing vector immunity in humans, which can hinder the vaccine-induced immunity. We found that there was significant level of circulating pre-existing ad 5 immunity in our participants. In contrast, in airways, only 50% of these participants carried detectable levels of ad 5 immunity. So next then, we analyzed whether this pre-existing ARV immunity has any impact on the vaccine immunogenicity. And we did not see any significant 
correlation between these two parameters, suggesting that there is no impact by the pre-existing immunity in the ARV. However, this observation needs to be confirmed in large sample size. So given the concern that pre-existing at 5 immunity may impair the vaccine immunogenicity, many other at zero types have been evaluated as vaccine vectors. One of them is the chimpanzee adenovirus serotype 68. Prevalence of pre-existing immunity to serotype at 68 is very small compared to at five pre-existing immunity. So to overcome the shortcoming of AD5, we also developed an ad 68 based TB vaccine and evaluate its efficacy in the presence of pre-existing AD5 immunity. For this, mice were first exposed to AD5 to generate pre-existing immunity and then were immunized with AD5 or AD5 TB vaccine. Four weeks later, they were challenged with MDB and bacterial burden in the lung was examined. We observed that while pre-existing AD5 immunity hindered the protection rendered by the AD5 TB vaccine, it did not have any impact on the protection rendered by the AD5 vaccine. So what we have learned from all these um, studies is that our preclinical and the recent clinical studies provide us with solid foundation and proof of concept to develop mucosal vaccination strategies to other respiratory pathogens. In our recent review, we have outlined these immunological principles to guide effective COVID-19 vaccine development. Taken all these into consideration, we have recently developed and evaluated at five and at chim based COVID vaccines in animal models, a single dose of either at five or at chim based vaccine delivery to the respiratory mucosa provided robust protection, not only against ancestral, but also against variants of concern of SARS-CoV-2. So now we are hoping to evaluate these vaccines in clinical trials. So thank you. Thank you so much, Phil and Matthew. Great talks. Um, so if you have questions, please uh, put them in the question and answer uh, section and I will uh, either read them out or I will ask you to unmute yourself. Um, I have a couple of questions to start us off. Um, I have a question for Phil, first of all, on the parad paradoxical reaction. Um, does does the, the extent of the response or even the response itself depend on what drug regime you give the patient? No, usually you have patients, you know, they will have susceptible drug. It's classically with lymph nodes where they have lymph node TB and it's sort of going well. And then the lymph node opens and starts draining. We always worried that they're failing therapy, they require drug resistance. And classically, if you get a paradoxical reaction, you may get AFB, which means that there is TB there, but usually it won't grow. Mm -hmm. So the other patient that I saw, which taught me this more than a decade ago, was a guy who had disseminated or miliary TB in his lungs. And then a few months into therapy, he became aphasic. And then when we MRI'd him, he let up. It's a bit similar to what we teach people with neutropenia, that when patients are neutropenic, you don't see disease. And the sort of equivalent of that in TB, if your CD4s are deficient, then you're not, you know. With AIDS, and essentially, this was first described with AIDS and mycobacterium avium complex. So when Proteus inhibitors came in the mid 90s, we had this whole population of patients who were immunocompromised. And then we would give them the protease inhibitors, and then they would form these abscesses with mycobacterium avium. Usually in the before that, mycobacterium avium sort of disseminated in patients, and we only found it in blood once it sort of overwhelmed them. So you sort of think of the CD4 cells as a way of controlling the mycobacteria, and if your CD4 cells aren't functioning, 
then the mycobacteria keep replicating and dividing. That's sort of my simplistic version of seeing all of this and clearly it's much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. And in miliary TB, in my experience, you know, the TB skin test is negative. You don't have any T cells. You know, if you develop miliary TB or disseminated TB, it probably means that your T cells or your granulomas or immunity is not able to contain it, which is why it keeps disseminating and you're not reacting to it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you see disease, sometimes you don't see disease. The other thing with TB, there's always this, what I talked about sort of adult TB, which is cavity and upper lobe disease. And then there's what we call immunocompromised TB or childhood TB or TB and HIV, which is usually sort of infiltrates and more diffuse lung disease. So the clinical presentations can be a bit different, but essentially you sort of, you know, keep looking and it's like you see them, so. Great, thank you. Um, and I also have a question for Mathy. Um, the, the people who are getting the uh, COVID vaccine developed in Oxford, that's an adenoviral vectored vaccine. Do you, I, there's going to be a lot of people who have gotten that vaccine around the world. Do you, do you expect to have some interference between people who have received that vaccine and subsequently get a, an adenoviral vectored vaccine for things like TB? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so even in our trial, I think we, we're going to exclude those people who already volunteered for our vaccine trial in for TB vaccine trial. Um, I think uh, there shouldn't be any problem because the antigens, there is no antibodies against AD5 in these AD chim vaccinated people. So it shouldn't compromise the uh, our vaccine induced immunity. Um, so I don't think there would be any problem by giving, and also now we're going to give it aerosol. So I don't think that it would have any impact on the efficacy of this new COVID vaccine that's developed at MAC. Mm -hmm. And do, do you envision giving the um, aerosolized TB vaccine to people who are already infected? Do you, or is this more of a, a prophylactic strategy? Yeah, so we have done some studies in our lab uh, using it as a therapeutic vaccine uh, in mice that are already having the TB infection. Uh, and we found that it is a really good therapeutic vaccine as well. So yeah, I think it's possible to use it as a therapeutic vaccine as well. Do you, do you think it would work in scenarios such as Phil was describing earlier, where you have a, a person with an HIV positive sort of background to layer this onto? I'm just, I'm trying to get a feel for whether a person who has HIV and TB is going to benefit from a, a respite, uh, like a aerosolized vaccination? Yeah, the only concern is that uh, these people may lack uh, CD4 T cells, right? Mm -hmm. So giving the vaccine, I'm not sure whether it will work because uh, in our TB trial now, we noticed that it induces a very strong CD4 T cell um, vaccine specific responses. Um, so in HIV people, if their CD4 counts are reasonable, I think maybe this vaccine may work. But in those, uh, yeah, with the low counts of CD4 T cells, I'm not sure. Maybe, yeah, we have seen some level of CD8 T cell responses as well, but it's not nowhere close to the CD4 T cell responses mm -hmm. after this uh, aerosol vaccination, yeah. So the, the machine that you're using to deliver the vaccine um, seems pretty sophisticated. Is there is there going to be a sort of more user friendly version of that down the road, sort of like a like an asthma inhaler, maybe? Uh, yeah, eventually, I think we may have to develop something like that. But even this one is a very simple machine and everything is disposable, the mouthpiece and uh, the, the delivery system is disposable. So we use it a new one for every participant. Uh, yeah, we need to develop something easy to be 
uh, used to, to deliver vaccine, particularly in uh, TB endemic areas, right? We are, it's, mm. uh, it's not rich countries. So we have to develop something a very simplified form of it, yeah. I, I was trying to imagine one of these, you know, max vas mass vaccination sites, instead of having a row of seats and nurses with syringes that we have a row of these, you know, <laughs> inhaling inhalant machines, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, I think now Zoe is uh, collaborating with this engineering um, people where they, they are going to develop a dry powder of this vaccine. So it can be delivered as some of those inhalers. Mm -hmm. And and is this is the aerosol version of the vaccine um, potentially useful in children? Yeah, I think it's it's really that's one of the advantages, right? Because children are always scared of needles, and it's so easy for them to inhale the vaccine and. I think that's one of the major advantage of this aerosol vaccination. It's needle free. Mm -hmm. And is there, is there a way to model that in animals before going into humans, into a pediatric population? Yeah, that's a good question. So that, that's why I think we are trying to do with this dry powder. So they are trying to come up with a dry powder that can easily be sprayed into the mouth of the animals. So we can just see whether it can get enough immune responses and protection. Uh, yeah, after that, maybe we may move into developing that sort of delivery systems. Okay, and last question, since I'm not seeing any in, in the chat here. Um, how's your patient doing, Phil? <laughs> so he actually had a very bad outcome and passed away. Oh, well, that's too bad. He was probably very, very sick when he presented. And then when I presented him in ID rounds, really the question was whether what systemic factors of discrimination that he was labeled as being depressed and not taken seriously for these physical complaints that he had for a year. So we think he was sick for a very long time. We never got a good, good explanation for why he immune reconstituted. My current feeling is he got the B12 and the B12 probably boosted his bone marrow into getting some immune response. And whether he had terminal allele disease that you sometimes get with TB that was also undiagnosed and he was B12 deficient. So when they threw all that B12 at him, that's what caused him to iris. But he probably had, you know, profound CNS disease, a lot of disseminated disease. And, you know, as much as we tried for a month or two, we felt he wasn't turning in the right direction. And we you know, had strong conversations with the ICU to sort of palliate him because we felt that even if he survived, he would be very neurologically non-intact. That would not be really a victory for him, particularly being mm -hmm. separated. So, you know, the hard thing with TB is people don't recognize it or people don't look for it and recognize who's at risk. And then, you know, I think the issue with the vaccines is do you offer the vaccines before people are exposed? Do you offer the vaccines once people have latent disease to boost their immunity? And I think that's sort of still a bit of a question. So, because remember a lot of people are probably exposed, let's say in Canada before they even come here. So, mm -hmm. so essentially, you know, how you can sort of deal with immune boosting and I just want to have a couple of comments. With HIV, we tend to not vaccinate people when they're very immunocompromised or very low. We try to treat them and get their immune system better and they feel the vaccines work better because in a way they're like the elderly or anything, but you can actually reverse yeah. that process or improve it. Also, uncontrolled HIV and AIDS is a huge risk factor for COVID. So I have a colleague who had two Afri an African couple who were not well controlled in Brampton both got COVID and died last week and have left orphan children. So uncontrolled HIV AIDS, essentially because you can't control that. Once you get COVID, you, you, I think you stay by remake, the virus keeps replicating, you can't control it and both of these people died. So, you know, it's rare in Canada, but in a lot of the third world, we have a lot of people have uncontrolled HIV, COVID is going rampant and they don't have vaccines. So it's a bit of a recipe for disaster. So. Well, hopefully 
the work that Matthew's doing will help address that. Perfect. On both fronts, both TB and COVID. <laughs> so thank you both again for speaking and thank you to the audience for coming and spending the morning with us. We will see you next month for November's rounds. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.